Sergeant Thomas Hayeswood McFadder, United States Marine Corps, World War II. We've got a treat for you here, folks. Thomas served with the United States Marine Corps in the 8th Marine Ammunition Company on Iwo Jima. He landed on D-Day February 19, 1945 supplied ammunition for the frontline troops as a sergeant and just tells a tremendous story one of the best i've got of iwo jima folks there were roughly seven or eight hundred black americans serving on iwo jima and yet you don't hear much about them at all and I, that's a shame and I, I wish i would have found more um but i have several and uh have about 20 black americans that have served our country from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Gulf War, Iraq, Afghanistan. So and I'm going to be featuring them soon in a special video. But um, this, this is a fond memory. Thomas and I met. He became a Presbyterian minister after World War II. But he tells a, 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 gr a gripping story of what happened and the death and the casualties and just what it was like being a young man, a black American on Iwo Jima during a time of segregation in our country. In the military so but uh, I, I'm just happy to share it with you a little bit about Thomas he uh, was one of the first Navy chaplains now he got out of the war World War II became a Presbyterian minister went back into the Navy United States Navy retired in 1983 as a Navy captain uh, it wasn't he served in Vietnam so just a very uh, very diverse uh, amount of different things he did in the military and he retired in 1983 from the military, but just lived a great life. Promised God that if he survived a mortar barrage on Iwo Jima, he would serve him for the rest of his life, and he held true to that word, so I'm excited. Um, I wanna thank Steve and Abby Risso for sponsoring this story. Thank you guys. Thank you for sponsoring another story here and seeing the importance of getting these into the hands of our young people, and for history's sake and as a legacy that will live on forever and ever and ever. We need to learn from our history, so Steve and Abby, I, I love you guys, hope to see you soon. Um, where you live and um, you don't know that yet but anyways uh, I hope that happens and uh, but thank you for sponsoring this story and my, your continued support of my work and to our veterans in this country folks if you like to sponsor a story like Stephen Abbey all you got to do is go to my website LarryCapetto.com click on the link that says sponsor a vet you'll see pictures of a lot of my veterans just include their name in the sponsorship and I could really use your help I really can I have I still have hundreds of stories in my archives. I'm getting ready to go out on the road and interview more Vietnam vets this year. Going to re-interview some of my veterans that I've already interviewed 15, 20 years ago. I won't tell you who, I don't want to give it away. It's going to be awesome, powerful. I'm going to talk to them uh, a second time. And if you'd like to sponsor a veteran, like I said, it's on my website. Information also in the video description below the video, there's information. There's a link that says sponsor a vet. If you'd like to donate to my work, that'd be greatly appreciated. Uh, there's the comment section below my video. The first comment is always mine, and there's information in there on donating to my work, folks. You're being touched, you're being blessed, you're being helped through these videos. I would ask you to please pay it forward. It would be a great a blessing to me and for those that will be listening to these stories. And Voices of History Radio is going loud and strong, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, over almost 40 countries now. Sweden has just come online. A lot of people are watching, listening from Sweden, so don't know why. If you're out there from Sweden, let me hear from you. I want to share something amazing. Thomas, he worked in the ammunition company, but he had a pole, uh, a standard pole, a metal pole, I'm assuming, on the island. And that actual pole was used for the first flag raising on Iwo Jima, February 23rd, 1945. There were two flag raisings. We see the famous photo from Joe Rosenthal that became iconic, and everybody knew the second flag raising, and there were movies made and books written, but nobody knew about the first flag raising. I actually interviewed Chuck Lindbergh. He was living in Minnesota in 2005. I went up there. It was cold. It was December, and I got his story. He was the only living flag raiser of e either flag raising, and uh, but there were, f I think there were six on the first flag raising also, so. But Thomas supplied the pole for that, so there's some history and trivia for you. Okay, folks, I can go on and on and on, but Thomas McFadder, you're in for a treat. This is a one-hour interview I did with him in San Diego, California. It was September 26, 2005. He passed away in 2009, about 86 or 87 years old, and uh, just a tremendous life lived. I miss him. I miss all my veterans. I know they're in heaven watching us, looking down on us. I told every one of them that their stories would live on, and that's what's happening. So, Thomas, thank you for your service to our country. I'm happy to share your story right here on my Voices of History YouTube channel and my radio station. And folks, God bless you. Thank you for watching, subscribing, and I'll talk to you soon.
tell him, tell me, you already told me on the phone, but tell me who you're with on Iwo Jima. You're one. Of, you're with the Ammo Bears. That's what was your job on Iwo Jima. Is that correct? What, what was I was a sergeant in the Eighth Marine Ammunition Company of the Eighth Field Depot. Uh, my platoon was attached to the 3rd, 4th, and 5th Marine Divisions to supply ammunition, <laughs> all of it. We maintained dumps from D plus 2, 3, until the battle was over. We manned the dump that blew up on Iwo Jima. And there was no ammunition there. Uh, but the Marines had to have more ammunition, which they called priority ammunition, like mortars, rockets, TNT, and other explosives. It was the only way it could be brought in was by plane. And the plane could not land because the enemy had all of the airports locked in. Any movement would readily attract mortars and rockets and other kinds of fire snipers onto the airfield. So it became my mission assigned by my platoon leader, John D'Angelo, to get a group of men, a detail of men, and go to the airport and have them uh, dispersed for the purpose of chasing colored parachutes that were being dropped from the planes around the airfield. This was a most fearful and frightening experience, but it had to be done to chase parachutes in the rear sights of the enemy who began to snipe after us as we moved following those air, those parachutes, those airdrops. One of the experiences that is responsible for my ministry and the change of my life came as a result of coming under a barrage of mortar fire by the enemy at the time I was chasing these parachutes. I jumped into a bunker, which is a shell hole left by a larger projectile from a ship. But when I jumped into this bunker, there was a young white Marine in there clutching the photographs of his family with blood coming from his ears, his nose, his mouth, and he was dying. If you know of Iwo Jima and what the terrain was, there was very little ground space, and the ground actually wasn't ground, it was volcanic ash, which was trembling all the time. Most of the places you sought to dig a foxhole, if you went more than a foot underground, you got hot sulfur. It was a sulfur rock. And there, under these kinds of conditions, me in this hole, you could do nothing but just dig out with your helmet enough area to stick your, your head in. 
and lie there by this dead man and await your round, hoping that there would be no round, praying the Lord's Prayer over and over and over in the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. It was during this experience that I promised God if he would let me live that I would give him the rest of my life in service. And that is what I have done. We were there on Iwo Jima with the last brush fire, so to speak. The last patrol of kamikazes who came up from near the airfield at the other strip, I guess vowing that they were going to take five Marines for every one of them that had that would die. Of course, most of the Marines had already been pulled away from the island. The island was secure. No one was on the island except some pilots and fifth pioneers. And uh, they came down by the beach and some aviation engineers, these were army folk, they came down in a form of straight line going down through the area where these army folk had tents and pilots. They had tents. We were still living in the dirt. And as they went down through there, we're cutting the guy ropes on the tents and just running men through with their swords and uh, Burnett on, in my platoon sounded the alert. And of course, we just sit up there on the edge of our holes in the dirt. And as they came over toward us, we just laid them out. Uh, this is a part of the annals of the Battle of Iwo Jima, though it has not been played out. And you hear very little about it. I don't know why, and yet I, yet I do know why. <laughs> because we have been the Marines that weren't even there. I tell of the experience because it's part of my life. I went back and I was, after about a year, I was discharged from the Marine Corps. And I went back to college and pursued my work as a Presbyterian minister. I have labored for almost 50 years as a chaplain and as a pastor and as a community activist for justice and peace. Uh, recognized in many ways, but not living for recognition living to fulfill the commitment and promised that I'd made to God on Iwo Jima. You said you were one of 750? 750 Americans of African descent. Some people say African American I'm not an African-American, I'm an American. Uh, I don't seldom use the word black unless it is in the context of an adjective because that's what it is. That's what it is. When, did, when did you land on the island, Tom? When did you actually come on, sh on, on the island? What, do you remember the day? Or? Uh, I, I would say D-Day, but we were standing by to go in on D-Day. No, you, no Marines went in on D-Day. 
they, the ones who went in on D-Day were mostly left on the beach because the enemy, as soon as they, 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 the first three waves, I guess, landed, the enemies came out from bunkers and every place else and just killed them. And I heard the ship, the shore radio calling in for evacu evacuation. We Americans couldn't even get evacuation boats, Higgins boats, in to get the men out. They just blew them up. So we went in the next day, right along with all the rest of the troops. I guess it was D plus one. So you went on D plus one? I did. And you, did you, okay. Did you go in on a Higgins boat, Tom? No, we went in on LST. And as we pulled in on the tee, there were bodies all up, floating around like trash, bloated bodies, uh, mostly Americans. But as soon as the the the, the well the the, the 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 ramp was down, and the lieutenant was leading me, and as soon as we hit the island, the stuff started coming in. We had to start crawling. I crawled up with him near the, the foot of Mount Serbachi. And he told me to hold the men there. He was going to find out where we were to go. And uh, he did, and he told me we were going to have to go up to an area near Serbachi and establish a temporary ammunition store. That was a place where the ammo would be brought into and possibly some conveyor belts come off the tee to up to the land where the men would take it off the conveyor and bring it on over into the store. Uh, this is where we were for two days or more. Uh, right until the, after the flag was raised. And uh, the men who raised the flag came to me in my unit and wanted to know if I had any pipes or wooden poles they could use for way, raising the flag. All they had was the flag. They got pipes from this dunnage and stuff that we had from the ammo and raised the first flag. And uh, once we saw that, we felt secure <laughs> because an American flag that had been raised at the highest point on the rock. But the stuff got worse. It didn't get any better. Tell me, Tom, when you landed on that beach, um, you're a young man. Um, you saw the casualties. Yes. What's going through your mind? And what what are you seeing when you when you when you when that happens? What are you seeing? What are you hearing? What's going on? What I'm seeing and what I am hearing is you got a job to do. Let's move. The death, the stench of death and black powder. I could not think about that. I was scared. Yes. But I couldn't afford to act scared because I was a sergeant. I, I couldn't afford to be scared or I would have been stultified in my track. So I had to keep moving and make the men keep moving that ammo. Tell me about the casualties. What, what, what did you see and could you help any of them? Uh, not at that time. Men were getting hit and hollering, uh, you, you, you just don't take time when you're involved in moving ammo unless you're corpsman. And uh, that was the way it was. We didn't have a, the immediate casualties that were hit. They were drug out of the, from out of the formation. They were moved. I think we lost two men. 
What about the other Marines? I heard there were a lot of casualties. What What do you remember seeing? Maybe was there a, a worst part of that landing or that, that first day or two? That you no, there were a lot of men that were hit and killed. But you must remember <laughs> that the United States Marine Corps at that time was a segregated branch of the military. And all we were, we weren't supposed to be attacking anybody. We were first noted just as service troops. But everybody on that island at Iwo Jima, you didn't know where the enemy was going to strike, was just as uh, vulnerable as anyone else once you got into it. Uh, sleep, rest, no such thing. You're moving all the time and suspecting anything that you heard because there were no bushes, there were no trees, the island was bare. And all you had was this black axe. And that mountain over there, you see a little brush somewhere, you can look off across from Iwo Jima at some of the other little Jimas, the little outlets there, from where the enemy was, was lobbing from knee mortars stuff in there on us. They weren't even there. You didn't see it. The enemies that I saw were being flushed out of the side of Mount Sarabachi by bulldozers. Uh, they were coming out of the side of Mount Sarabachi. An experience that I can uh, uh, relate, uh, I'll never forget it. I saw a Marine with a flamethrower on his back shooting that hot stuff as uh, uh, I guess the CBs were excavating a part of Sarabachi trying to get a road up to the top and out come Japanese. He put that hot napalm on him. And he comes out screaming and hollering, on fire. American Marines and Corman rushed to this man Rifle in the ground, put up point for blood plasma to save his life. And of course that bothered me because he had my eyes said, now, here we are trying to save somebody that we've been taught to hate and kill and maim use, using American blood. And it bothered me until I got back to the States and began to make a study of blood. Only four types, major blood types in the world. I don't care how your eyes look or what the color of your skin is. And I wrote an article about that called Sense and Nonsense about race years ago. But that was Part of my experience. What's Tom? This question. What What's the sound of battle sound like? Well, what do you? I mean, what What does it sound like when you're in combat? What is What, what are you hearing? What? Battle. Uh, if I can describe it, it's like now. A part of my health, I hear little uh, little things going off all the time in my ears. It was like that here, nothing but guns, nothing but guns, and screaming and hollering, men getting hit, men stepping on mines, uh, and the smell of that black powder. Smoke, you're always under smoke, and no clear when you're really involved in the battle. Smoke and the smell is the smell of guts and big green flies of bodies looking like they got armor plate on them. And you don't fan them off, you have to take them off, knock them off. Uh, no water to hardly drink, 
little to shave, maybe a canteen a day. No sleep. You lean up against some ammo, uh, lay out with somebody watching while you take a break. None of that eating K rations, mouth developed, scab, and sore from eating those hard K rations for the first five or six days, and maybe seven, and then we got C rations from cans and things, it was better. What do you think was the worst thing you saw on that island the whole time you're there? What comes to your mind maybe was the worst thing or the hardest thing for you on the island? Well, I saw something and I thought about how uh, war brings out the savagery in man. I saw what you might call a stockade up where prisoners were being held. It was right down near the beach. It was Constantina ride, two or three rows of Constantina wide. And um, the men they were capturing were being brought down there. You had Marines holding them in guard duty. Um, we got the message, uh, scuttlebutt we call it, that two corpsmen had been in a cave looking for souvenirs. And uh, they were captured by the, uh, by the enemy. And they cut the penis off and stuck it in their mouths and brought them back up and threw them up on the side of one of the caves. Well, when that word passed around, there was no more taking of prisoners. The stockade was stormed. I saw them clean the place out. Cause we were right on a, a knoll like where we could see what was going on down in that that brig uh, stockade, and they moved in there and took them out, walked them out into the water till they couldn't see anything but their heads, and shot them. That was the most inhuman thing I had seen. But you know, when you're in war. Mean things are done. The worst that we could be comes out. Vengeance is a mark of identification to your worth and your value. That still stands out in my mind. You mentioned, I'm going to jump ahead, but you mentioned looking at the picture of my va film about the cemetery. Tell me about the cemetery. You said they're dr bringing them in or all the bodies. What were you saying? Well, the cemetery uh, I was manned primarily by depot company. They had little black men. It's called grave registration. We had to take a couple of men down there. I went to look at, at the 5th Marine Division. Uh, cemetery. They had gorged out of the side of the ash a long trough in the dirt and ash, and they were putting bodies down. Very few men you saw were whole. There were pieces because they'd been ripped apart by shrapnel, mortified, and gunfire. Very few people, the men that I saw, had bullet holes in them. Uh, and they pick up what they could in a poncho, a shelter hand. And you take it down, you lay it down, and you'd put a layer of ash on it, and you'd come and you put another uh, uh, layer of body down, you put a layer of ash on it, and then you'd close it off if you had two or three, depending on how many bodies you had. And that was for the purpose of controlling disease and uh, the purpose of laying out in some symmetrical pattern a cemetery shaped like a cross. And all it had on it was a dog tag and you had about two feet of uh, dirt, wasn't no long grave. 
I, I think the transplanted took all those bodies back. But it always amazed me how you're going to tell whose body, whose body is what. But that's battle. Do those memories seem like yesterday or does it seem like a long time ago? Uh, there are times when they seem like yesterday. I try to keep them as far back as I can by bringing to the forefront all of the experiences I've had since then. You obviously were a praying man back then. I mean, oh, without a doubt. Yeah, I, I've heard there's no atheists in the foxhole. There are none. I've heard men who were some of the greatest uh, cussers and mean and profane they get hit. And, oh, mama! That's the first thing they call is his mother. And the next thing they call on their Lord, have mercy. No, no such thing in the foxhole. Mm -mm. Were you were you able to help any of the wounded, or you said the corps men did that? So you really didn't have a chance. I know. I was too busy. You got an assignment in the Marine Corps. You carry out your order. That's what it's all about. You don't. You don't get. It. I didn't have anybody being hit right was near me, you know. There, there were other Marines, I'm sure, who were on assault waves or uh, in rifle companies who had the responsibility of going flushing the enemy out of caves and things like that. But mine was to get the ammunition. And uh, certainly uh, when our dump got hit, and the ammo began to explode, uh, we began to feel maybe the enemy had infiltrated our position. And you start looking uh, to see if there are enemies. And we had been told that there were Japanese who were taking American bodies and stripping them down and putting on American Marine Corps uniform. So uh, the night when the dump was, burn, was, was burning, and I was in that dump with Lieutenant D'Angelo and trying to use an entrenching tube to put out the fire, the first thing was burning was small arms because we had it so constructed that small arms was between your high explosive, 30 caliber material. And it was burning. He tried to keep that from burning. Um, uh, Lieutenant D'Angelo said, all right, let's get it. see if we can get an armored bulldozer to come in and move this stuff out. The company commander, Captain Blackett, he shows up and he says, Sergeant McFadden, you get some men in there and get that, put that fire out? I say, sir, if the bulldozer can't do it, I can't do it. And all of a sudden, that must have been some TNT or something went off, and the whole island shook, or uh, shape charge. And I said, let's go for the beach, let's head for the beach. And ammunition was just flying everywhere, all around. All around, ammunition was flying everywhere. Smoke bomb hit near me and scalded my face. I kept running for the beach. Got down there, you couldn't assemble, because if you assembled a group of men, you were a target. You got down there, and the uh, Navy, they had men in their gun emplacements, and they were ready because they felt the enemy had launched an attack. When the dump was blowing up, they launched an attack from somewhere. And I began to tell them, uh, you know, what was going on, and men were coming out of the side, of, off the hillside. And, uh, after the dump stopped blowing, I had the responsibility, I felt, of finding my men. So I went around trying to find what was there. Uh, three or four of them went back up on the hill. They were still in the crouch position at the dump. They never got out. We found a couple of others who had been killed probably by friendly fire who were running toward the beach. But you see, if you didn't, if you didn't remember 
your uh, uh, password. People kill you to ask questions later. Or you got to be coming. The password is American trees. So you come in over the hill hollering, oak tree, pecan tree, but you know, peach tree. Any kind of tree you can. And if, if you didn't say it, you just get blown away. You were on the island till the end? You stayed the whole 36 days? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. With no place else to go. Did you get in? Did you have to shoot an, uh, your rifle at all, or at the enemy, or did you get in any combat like that yourself? Well, I didn't. I didn't be. I didn't fire at an enemy per se, but I fired where I thought they were. When we were up there chasing those parachutes, because I had to get my men together. You couldn't bring them down at a particular point. We had to move the ammunition at a point where it could be picked up. Uh, and dispersed. And uh, I was a chaplain in the Navy, one of the first three black chaplains in the United States Navy. I have always believed in my country. And I believe if you serve, you should be served. To the victor goes a spoil. I don't care who you are. I left school and volunteered for the Marine Corps. I was a pre-theological student, but I wasn't sure that I wanted to be a preacher. I had a 4D deferment and tried to get into the United States Marine Corps, but I had already registered and was classified as 4D. So the Marines could not take me. I had to go back to my draft board and be class reclassified as 1A before I could even come into service. And it has been on the basis of that that primarily all of my movements and actions and thoughts have followed. I gave of my best. I was not a draft dodger. I put my life in arms away for justice. And I demand it. Therefore, I've been known most of my service life as a troublemaker. You see, I started off in a little Presbyterian school called Redstone Academy, where every morning you started out by marching into the, into the auditorium to the tune, Onward Christian Soldiers, marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. My Lord tells me to be in this world, but not of this world. And I know when I am in this world and not of this world, I'm at war. Not that I look for it, but that's the course of all persons and events that would seek to change and challenge the world in the military, out of the military, wherever I have been for justice and peace, in the spirit of love. That's been my life. That's been my life. Now, at 82, I feel just as, as devoted and concerned as I did when I was 22 to those tenants because I believe when it's all over out here, the Lord said, you've been faithful over a few things. Enter here into my kingdom and I'll make you rule over many. 
uh, I'm a believer. <laughs> I'm not just a speaker or an actor. I let my actions bespeak my beliefs. Anybody, anywhere, anytime will tell you that about me. What am I looking for? That for which I pray. You know what that is? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I can't pray for it unless I work for it. And to the measure of my abilities, everybody makes a difference. To the measure of my abilities, I'm going to be all that I can be. <laughs> I'm going to be all that I can be. I can change myself. I can change others. I've changed myself. We all have control over somebody. If we just take the time to be concerned enough about others. So that's been my life. Let me ask you a question about Iwo Jima, and we'll kind of wrap this up. But, um, looking back 60 years, Tom, and you mentioned our country, you mentioned being an American. In light of being a World War II veteran and an American, what does freedom mean to Tom? Uh, freedom. It's a tricky word. Uh, my friend Langston Hughes says, what is freedom if a man ain't free? Fred Douglas, one of my great admirers, said, uh, power concedes nothing. It means you've got to be working for it. Freedom is, believe me, please, freedom is a way of thinking that uh, looses you from the powers that control everything in the world. That loses you, your mind, your body, your resources. And I have watched my people, and I used to do it myself, saying, we shall overcome. I tell them I've overcome. <laughs> I'm free. <laughs> I have overcome because I know, who I, I know who I serve. I know that my Redeemer liveth. I know that justice will prevail. May not come tomorrow. Certainly isn't today. But justice will prevail. That's freedom to me. Is that sense of knowledge that you're free. And no one can hold me down. I'm a free man. When I declare myself, the only thing you can do is take me out and shoot me. We've done that to a lot of other people. What about the price for freedom? I mean, what would you tell a young person today that doesn't know about war or the cost of war? What would you tell them about the price for freedom? Uh, the price for freedom is the joy of living. <laughs> I'm a free man. I'm a joyful man. And nothing's going to take my joy because I'm free. If, you don't, if you're not a joyous person, if you don't feel the joy that God gives you, you are not a free person. You're constantly striving for something that's like the will of the wisp. It continues to escape you. This world is not my home. I'm just a passer through. 
And I say, thy kingdom come on earth as it is on in heaven. My freedom comes as I labor to make that exist. And I feel like I've made a difference. That's it. When you know you've made a difference, <laughs> you are you're a free man. You know, I tell my children, don't ever say to daddy, I try. I don't want to hear that. You can say to me, I did my best. And you're free. You're an achiever. That's all God expects. But know that now. You've done your best. And you're free. What does this country mean to you as a veteran? This country means to me... Uh, a land blessed by God to become the salt of the earth. <laughs> blessed by God to become the salt of the earth. Uh, and that's what I make it to measure my ability. Uh, it has the best form of government. Uh, its tenants are far reaching. I think they have been God centered, but man manipulated. Man manipulated. And why is it like that? That's the way God made it. But He's given me and all others who profess him the opportunity to, as they say, make it real. How about the American flag? What does that represent to you? Oh, the American flag is such an, I've, tell, I've told others, it's, it's a symbol of that freedom. In many foreign lands where I've been, and I've been one or two where I miss ships movement. But I'd go looking for the flag. And the way that flag was, was my security. <laughs> was my security. Um, that's simplifying it as best as I can. Other than I love that flag. But it's a symbol. It's no greater than I make it. I'm going to ask you one more question about Iwo Jima that I didn't ask you. Yes. Before you went in on the beach, on, on, uh, on the island, the night before the landing, do you remember where you were, what your thoughts were, and what the mood of the other men around you were before you landed on Iwo Jima? Before we landed, uh, we were standing by with packs and rifles along the sides of the ship, starboard, starboard and port, listening and watching, watching the planes up getting ready to go down and drop the stuff in and listening to, I guess you would call them the commander of the flights going and put those eggs in on the target, get closer in there and the pilot saying to whomever the commander was, it's hot in there, it's hot in there. I don't care, I want you to go in, drop those eggs on the target. You watch the plane come down and go in and whoosh, nothing but a whiff of smoke. To know then that uh, it was no more a charade. There wasn't anything glamorous anymore about it. I was going in there to live or die, to kill or be killed. That was what was on my mind. What did you know about Iwo Jima before you went there? Nothing. Didn't even know it existed until it had been out at six, six, seven days. And we were told where we were going. 
knew nothing at all about Iwo Jima. You mentioned Higgins boats. Did you see the Higgins boats going to shore with the first waves? Or oh, yeah, sure. What, what did you see and what happened? I saw them first go out and they form a rendezvous, maybe four or five miles, circling around, getting ready to go in and hit the beach. And, uh, you know, guns are going off, uh, uh, cruisers and destroyers and uh, a few battleships, watching them battleships, <laughs> watching them blow off their load and back up from the recoil and the big smoke rains followed behind a big blast of fire. Not knowing where it was going, what relationship I had to it, other than they were trying to bring down the enemy. As long as they had been bumming Iwo Jima, we didn't expect any kind of retaliation. And didn't see much when we went on, except bodies thrown around. Uh, did you see a lot of casualties when you went in on B plus one? Oh yeah. Nobody cleaned them up. They were still there. Dead everywhere. You're stepping over dead. You're moving them aside, pulling them out of the way. So you can move that ammo in there. How did that affect you as a young man? Well, it affected me, uh, it's not easy to describe because I had a job to do. I had a job to do and it was live or die. You had to do it. Uh, you don't think about the psychological effect of that kind of condition because you get all locked up in it. You foul yourself up. And my basic uh, preface was I didn't have to be there. See. Tell me briefly about the, <coughs> about the Marine Corps. Excuse me. Tell me how you feel about the Marine Corps then and now. The Marine Corps was a place a transition from boyhood to manhood for me. However, it was filled with racism. And I think that there's still a lot of racism in the core. Uh, but it provides, most of the men who were there, I would contend, either get in the core because they are running from something or trying to prove something. And I still think it's true. Tell me about the pride and the camaraderie of the Marine Corps. Uh, the pride and the camaraderie comes from listening to the history and the hardship you have to endure together, the uh, uh, way you are trained to take care of each other. And if you get into combat, or it was that way, if you're in combat, I had no brother. I was an 11th child and I had 10 sisters. Mm -hmm. So the Marine Corps provided me with brothers. Mm -hmm. My closest friend was uh, Bolera, Ralph G. Bolera. And he was a corporal in my section. We remained very close till his death. I correspond with his widow now son and grandson. Uh, periodically I will go to Los Angeles and go out to the great to the grave. He's in a mausoleum and leave some flowers there. Uh, I think about him regularly. Uh, he was a dear friend of mine. And all of them who were my contemporaries in the Marine Corps are still dear to me. 
I found it in San Diego, the Monfort Point Marine Association. One more question. What, what does Iwo Jima mean to you today, looking back 60 years? What does it mean to your life or to you today? When I look back on Iwo Jima, let me be as descriptive about this. It's a landmark in my life of change and uh, a point of belief in God that it made me know that the Lord did something for me I couldn't do for myself how finite I was. And it keeps me believing I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I fear no man, I fear nothing. Nothing. That's what it means to me. It also uh, has an humbling effect on me in recognizing that killing settles nothing. That war is another step toward resolution through understanding and... Tell me, for the record again, Tom, you were with the Marine Corps? And what was your, you were in what division? I was in the 8th Marine Ammunition Company. I was in the Marine Corps approximately 18 months to two years after they first admitted Americans of African descent. Uh, I was in uh, uh, Ammunition Company that was primarily responsible for the movement of ammunition, the fusing of rockets and mortars, and seeing that it got to the O3s, who were the riflemen. Mm -hmm. I guess I should say this. I came in with a designation in the United States Marine Corps of Thomas H. McFadden, United States Marine Corps, USMCR, SS not USMCR. The SS was added because I was in by selective service, which meant after the war, they didn't need me no more. They put me back out. I could no longer belong to the club. We had to prove ourselves. And everybody, when we first went into the Corps, tried to discourage us from being there, even to the recruiter about how dangerous it was going to be and how many men were dying in the Corps before I got there at Guadalcanal and other places. But we were determined that we would uh, prove them wrong. And I still feel they don't recognize us as they should. The Marine Corps has a Marine Corps birthday, the most celebrated thing in the Marine Corps history. A celebrated thing in the life of the Marines is their history. Every year they have it, but nothing is ever mentioned in there about the date and when they admitted the first Americans of African descent. The Marine Corps still uh, does not uh, give to uh, the Marvel Point Marines uh, the uh, opportunity to participate in the United Funds campaign, uh, service-wide, uh, uh, campaign, and it is, it's a not-for-profit organization, just like the Corps or any other organization.
I'm going to ask you to do one more thing for me. I've asked all the Marines I've interviewed to do this. If you could, could you give me a salute right into the camera, sir? Yeah. 